I have about 20 minutes to tell you everything that I and my team has been doing for the last 18 months. Um, and so since that's not possible, um, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect, which is um, the way that we implemented the PAD guidelines using an interprofessional team model. Oops. So, um, as Judy mentioned, I work for Sutter Health. Uh, we are a 22 hospital health system here in Northern California. The majority of our hospitals are right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, our region happens to be up near the capital city of Sacramento. I want to um, tell you all that and be honest about the fact that this project was initially funded by a very generous grant from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. What I don't want to happen is for you to leave here thinking that you can't do this work if you don't have a bunch of money supplied to you from an outside source. Because as you can see here, um, our region did more than a two to one match um, of the Moore Foundation funds. And I'll tell you that in, in terms of my association with the Moore Foundation, Yes, they do give us some very generous amounts of money, but for this project, what they really provided was the impetus and the encouragement to, to take it on. And I think that, in, in some cases, was much more important than the amount of money that they shared with us. This is our project team. Um, we have a director and a communications coordinator and a data analyst and some two interprofessional team coaches. And of all of the team, I, at that time, I was the only one who was solely um, dedicated to this single project. Everyone else has a, a lot more things to do. And so when I thought about implementing the PAD guidelines, and I'm going to talk also about the ABCDE bundle, I have to tell you that trying to do this in about a year in seven different hospitals was extremely overwhelming to me. Um, again, a lot of encouragement from my friends at the Moore Foundation. And so after a couple glasses of wine and I calmed down a little bit, I thought, what, what in my mind is, are the most important aspects of maybe launching this successful project. And so I call these things the four cornerstones for success. So of course I wanted to use evidence-based practice. I kind of have a tattoo uh, on myself somewhere that says only use evidence-based practice. The other thing I knew, because we were implementing the PAD guidelines in the form of the ABCDE bundle, um, I knew that this project lent itself to a multidisciplinary team. And so I really wanted to launch some interprofessional team exercises and, and things that would help our disciplines work together. And then, although we are called a region, we are really a group of seven loosely associated hospitals who often like to do things in seven different ways. So it was very important for me to foster some regional collaboration among all of our affiliates. And then my other personal goal, and what keeps me up at night, is to reduce the, the, the practice variation that is unjustified. I'm not saying that we shouldn't apply the art to our nursing and medicine practice and respiratory practice, um, but the unjustified practice variation that we see in our hospitals that does not provide good outcome for patients was very important to me. And so here we have um, the clinical practice guidelines for the management of pain, agitation, and delirium um, with our own Dr. Barr as the primary author. And the thing that was so amazing about these guidelines was not just that it provided information about how to treat pain, agitation, and delirium, but really it did all the background work for me by providing evidence-based assessment tools and also prevention strategies. And that's why I found these guidelines so remarkable. And they came about in my life at a time when I had to figure out how to implement all of these things and the guidelines were completely invaluable. And so what I thought then was we would use the clinical implementation of the PAD guidelines combined with the development of interprofessional teams to implement the ABCDE clinical bundle at the bedside for our patients. And that's exactly what we did. Um, I believe most of you in the room are probably intimately um, aware of what the ABCDE bundle is, um, but for those of you who are not, it involves the spontaneous waking trial and breathing trial um, described by Dr. Klumpus and the coordination of those two things. And also importantly, the C stands for choice of medication. So our goal was to move away from the use of benzodiazepines and move more into the use of propofol and dexmedetomidine. And of course, overall, was the reduction of sedation. And that's really where I think we made um, the biggest impact. Um, we implemented delirium monitoring because like many of you, we did not have any assessment for delirium. So we had no idea what our delirium rates were. And of course, the evaluation of our patients for exercise and early mobility. So I come to a lot of talks like this and I hear a lot about what people did. But sometimes I walk away without learning how they did it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about exactly how we did this. So 
I don't know, for some of you that are, that are uh, process improvement folks, did you ever you know, re learn a new set of guidelines and you kind of come down off the mountain with these carved stones and you think that it's the best thing you've ever seen in your life and if you simply prevent them, uh, I'm sorry, present them to other really intelligent thinking people that they're going to want to jump on the bandwagon and do this just about as much as you do. That's how it happens, right? Yeah. And so when I thought about how I had done that with the sepsis bundles and how I hadn't had um, as much um, of a response with a great amount of alacrity, I thought, how am I going to do this differently? And so how I did it was, and this is even before I had met Anthony, I heard so many patient stories about what happens to people with a post-ICU syndrome. And I would say to my colleagues, yes, we've kept them from dying, but we have not saved their lives. Okay, we want people to be able to go back to their lives. And so if I had 30 minutes to stand in front of a group of 100 nurses to introduce this project to them, I would spend 20 minutes talking about how we are hurting patients and only 10 minutes talking about the nuts and bolts of the protocol. And I found that that worked much better than trying to present all of the scientific evidence. So we invited people who were interested to attend conferences. We had meals together and we bonded. And when they came back to um, our, our system in our region, we said, we really want you to be on this regional implementation and design team. And so people were so gung-ho. I mean, people had gone to these conferences and sometimes they ran back to their units and they dragged poor sedated patients out of bed and tried to run them around the hallway. So we thought maybe we should step back a little bit and develop a plan. So we started at our regional level pretty much with all comers, anyone who was interested. And we brought them together and we said, we want to do two things. We want, we want to learn and teach each other because at this point, no one knew a whole lot about this work. We want to choose a name. And so we started off with choosing a name. And we said, well, our respiratory care friend said, well, you know, extubating is now, calling, is now called liberating from the ventilator. And so but other folks said, well, we're not just liberating from the ventilator. We're liberating from delirium, and we're liberating from sedation, and we're liberating from the bed. And ultimately, we want to liberate people from the ICU. And so we chose the name ICU Liberation. And I am very honored that the society has chosen that name for our national initiative. They also created a mission statement. And then we asked these folks, do you want to be an SME? Because again, at this time, there were no subject matter experts, at least in my group, because this was all new to us. And so what became important then was to go from our regional implementation and design team to groups of subject matter experts. So for folks who are interested, and many of them are in the room today, um, we had a regional group, one representative from each affiliate on the pharmacy team and on the respiratory care team and the physical therapy team and so forth. And these teams were then tasked with researching the, the evidence, learning as as much as they could and then sharing it with their colleagues at the same time producing order sets, protocols, guidelines, um, and policies so that we could ultimately have something to share with each affiliate about how to go about putting this into place and that's what we did. So again, we had this planning phase where we brought um, team members together, we created um, SME groups, and they created recommendations. And importantly, how they did this was they would come up with a great idea, a draft of a policy protocol or order set, and they would use the IHI model for improvement using small tests of change to test their ideas and to get feedback directly from the people at the bedside who were doing this. And we, their feedback was completely invaluable. And we had many, many iterations of our policies and protocols. And when we finished after several months, we felt like we had a really, really good product. We then moved from, um, we then moved from the regional um, uh, tier into the actual affiliate tier. And so we developed uh, what we called an affiliate implementation team. And this team was, again, one member from each of the, the disciplines, actually two RNs, who were meant to then start implementing the ABCDE bundle and the PAD guidelines for our patients in the ICU using small tests of change. But more importantly, and this is really the topic of my talk, is how do you teach a group of disparate disciplines who appear from the outside to be working together but really are doing separate things and the power structure is not quite as equal as we wanted it to be? And so my leadership development coaches created what I have found to be, after the fact, an amazing novel curriculum that not only incorporated 
evidence-based in professional team work, but they also married it incredibly for non-clinicians to the implementation of the PAD guidelines in the ABCDE bundle. So when we worked on, um, you can see this, this was a 12-week curriculum, two to three hours at a time. Everyone sat in the room, attendance was mandatory, and they went through things like how to make a shared decision, how to Im involve the patient and family in goal setting, how to address conflicts between each other, particularly when we're out in the open in front of patients and how to spread the work through sharing power and success with others. So you can see that this was um, really quite a robust curriculum and uh, the members who went through it found it incredibly, incredibly helpful. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but another key to our success was we chose an affiliate-based RN lead. So I couldn't be in seven places at one time. And so it was important for us to have an RN whose only job was to help move this, this initiative forward. Because I don't know about you, for the CNSs in the room, um, you probably have about 12 different priorities that you have to handle on a daily basis. And unfortunately, when our CNSs are spread so thin on our educators, it's really difficult to put complete focus on one project and be successful. So we took an RN who was giving care at the bedside, um, sometimes maybe during relief charge, someone who has experience, they have great relationships in their unit, and they're well-respected and typically informal leaders. And we elevated them to this initiative lead for a 12-month period. So it worked well because they were considered, for the most part, as one of us. They did some teaching. They taught folks how to do the CPOT, how to um, improve um, the validity and reliability of their RAS scores. They taught the CAM ICU. And they also mentored their colleagues. And they audited performance, which is very important. And they participated in the care of the patients. They helped mobilize patients. Um, and they participated in, in uh, interprofessional team rounds. And then towards the end of their 12 months, they transitioned into data collecting. And so here's really where the rubber meets the road for our work. Um, I'm going to borrow a concept um, from Dr. Falk Krasinski and talk about fruit. So some of you may still be in a situation which we call traditional, where we have expert decision making. And that is where a physician comes into the unit, whether it's IC or another unit. They see the patient and evaluate them. They come out and write some orders. And then they are to be carried out by these folks down here. And so the physician writes the orders. We receive them. And we do things to the patient. So in my fruit analogy, think of that as a bowl of fruit. Okay, We have a bunch of different fruit in a bowl. And they're maybe touching, but they're really not interacting at all. What most of you probably have at this point, then, is the next tier, which is called a multidisciplinary team. We still have an MD expert at the center, but we actually have some information being supplied to that individual from other disciplines. And so this would be considered consultative decision making, where the physician is using input from the others, but there really isn't any sharing of decision making in a plan. So in my fruit analogy, think of this as kind of like fruit salad. Okay, There's a little bit of connection, but there's still kind of a head banana. Okay, So what we were moving to then was what we wanted was an interprofessional care team, where we take the physician out of the center and make him or her part of the team. You'll see that both the patient and family are in this team. And it's very important that the power structure is more equal. So when our folks on this team go through the interprofessional team curriculum, they learn that their role is valued, that their expertise is recognized, and they're taught to use these keywords of I recommend. So, um, for instance, respiratory care practitioner may come to interprofessional team rounds and say, um, I was able to coordinate with the RN with the spontaneous awakening trial. Actually, the patient, we didn't have to reduce their sedation very much because they were just a RAS of minus one. I was able to perform the spontaneous breathing trial. The patient passed, and I, I recommend extubation as soon as possible. That's the way that sounds. And each individual discipline is allowed um, to make those contributions. There's space provided for them, and they recommend based on um, their expertise. So if this is the fruit bowl, and this is the fruit salad, this is the fruit smoothie. Okay. So I don't know if, you are, if you'd rather have a bowl of fruit or a jamba juice, but I think we know. So here's kind of the picture of what the interprofessional team curriculum looks like. We coordinate our activities. We do PDSA cycles to practice our tests of change. We implement what we learned in rounds, and we influence change to others around us. We cooperate with each other by developing a self-awareness and an understanding of how we actually interact with each other and how maybe the, um, this power struggle needs to be left behind, and we need to work more as a cooperative team. 
In partnership, we partner together to emphasize each, member's, uh, each team member's skills. We include the patient and family in our decision making and goals. And so a lot of what happens is we clarify our roles, but we also share in the treatment of the patient by blending our roles. And we also learn to value everyone in the group as as important as the other. And at the center of this, then, we derive a collaboration. So you can imagine that this was um, a little bit of a change for some of our practitioners. And um, one of the things that I didn't mention on an earlier slide, and I heard Dr. Klompas say this. So if I came to your unit and I said, um, by the way, you're hurting patients, so I have this protocol and I'm gonna completely change the culture in your unit. So even if it's a good thing, you're probably like, whoa, this changing my culture, what? And so what we really focused on was small behavioral changes, which when they all added up after 12 months, at the end, we had a cultural change, but we never go in saying we're gonna change our culture because that just doesn't fly. And so here's what some of the team members said. Our RN team lead said, you know, in our AIT, the egos were checked at the door to allow for every profession to speak, to be heard, and resolve our problems together. A respiratory care colleague said, I am loving my job again, because they feel valued. At some of our hospitals, respiratory care is actually now the team member who brings up um, the patient's uh, chest x-ray and discusses it in collaboration with the physician. They feel valued. They have more job satisfaction. And one of our MD leads said, now I understand exactly where I can make a difference and how it's important for me to be part of the process. So be engaged with team members and be part of the process, very important. We also use another tool which, I, which was very valuable, and um, it's called Yammer. And think about um, a hybrid between Facebook and Twitter. And this is important because instead of emailing each other, all we have this you know, collaborative work across regions and on teams. People post things, um, their ideas, protocols, drafts for people to look at, and it really enhances um, the ability of the group to work together, even when they're not in the same physical location. The other thing that it does, and uh, Heidi, I don't know if she's, I don't remember if she said it in this talk, but she always says, um, seeing is believing. And so when you start um, ambulating, reduce sedation on patients so that you're able to ambulate them around the hallway, and people see that first patient in their unit standing, walking, and moving, and it's kind of an aha moment, like, wow, maybe this, maybe this stuff can fly. So imagine then if someone in your unit is, is walking a patient, and someone in all seven ICUs can actually see that happening by getting onto Yammer. And as you can see here, um, many, many people saw this. So we had, um, we had folks from uh, PT, RT, um, quality. We had a, a, a physician at a different hospital, a physical therapist. We had a chief of staff at the hospital notice this was happening. Um, and our, ch our assistant chief medical officer of the region was able to see this. So this is a way to, um, this is a way to spread what's happening in a quicker way. So to say that we had no challenges, of course, would be a lie. I mean, shifting practices of for practitioners that was based on either outdated evidence or maybe no evidence as all, at all is very difficult. And of course, we had some early adopters and some laggards. Um, but the fact that we were able to continually reiterate the education and the experience for the people on our team was very important. And some of my affiliates are pretty small. I mean, they have like six ICU beds. So there's not a lot of personnel and resources available. And one of my um, affiliates, if the pharmacist comes to interprofessional team rounds, there's no one in the pharmacy. So it's a little bit difficult, but we, we learn to overcome that challenge. And then importantly, is, more importantly, is data collection. If we can't show that what we're doing is making a difference, um, we really don't have a leg to stand on. Um, what we see is, as being successful now is just the fact that we've implemented. I hope to be back here a year from now um, presenting some of our outcomes data. And so to conclude, I love this quote from R. Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think that's what we did in our hospitals. Thank you very much.